What is it for? And it's like every day, okay, not four days, but like three of the days I, I had an opportunity to pray for somebody. Oh, good. Yeah. I went to somebody's house and prayed on, what day was that? Sunday. Then somebody came to my house unexpectedly on Monday. <laughs> Great. And somebody came to my house. Somebody came to my house on Tuesday. So great. I'm just excited about that. All right. Yep. All right. Anybody else? James, you want to share your testimony from uh, the other day, real quick, or whatever you got? Okay. Um, first, I had. Someone that was dealing with a headache for three weeks, a consistent headache for three weeks in a row. Called and prayed for them, and headache gone. Headache. She was completely set free of that one. That was Lana. Then uh, we had on outreach Saturday, me and Levi prayed for a gentleman that was almost completely deaf. We prayed for him by the time when he was done, hearing restored, which that was awesome. Then a couple of houses down, a lady dealing with stress and anxiety real bad. Um, prayed for her, and she was set free. She said she felt great afterwards. So that was, that was pretty amazing. <laughs> pretty amazing. Then we had, um, oh, my gosh, Saturday night. Um, Tina, of course, having some physical pain, her knee swelling, the swelling of her knee. We prayed for it, and you can sit there, and her jeans relaxed around her knee. The swelling went down. So, there you go. Can you guys see that there? Right there. Yeah. That's that, rusty. Yeah. I uh, got his hearing restored. I uh, yeah, I blurred his face out, but there he is, right there, because I I shared that yeah. on Facebook. <laughs> so that's a that's pretty awesome. <laughs> this is uh, this is Cheryl. Um, she's holding up a picture of her. What do you call those things that make? This is Cheryl. <clears throat> um, she's holding up her. Uh, what do you call those things? A uh, oxygen reader. She had. Uh, it was it was ninety six, and she she took it off her finger, and started dropping because it was not on her finger, but it was at ninety six, and she has been on oxygen for five years, and has been suffering with um, COPD and pulmonary hypertension. You can see she's got the oxygen thing on her, and even with the <clears throat> oxygen going. She was having short kind of labored breaths, just short breaths, you know, and even with her wearing her oxygen all the time, she never went above 90 on her uh, oxygen meter. And most of the time she's in the eighties, upper eighties. And, uh, we went to her door and said, who in your house needs to be healed? She said, I do. And, uh, you know, some people can take it or leave it, but she couldn't leave it. She had to take it. And so we just, took her hand, commanded her body to heal and breathe normally. And instantly she started taking deep breaths and, and said, I couldn't do that before. And it was just such a shock to go from uh, just at home and under the burden of this thing <clears throat> to all of a sudden her entire life just changed. And uh, she was able to breathe normally and deeply and I said, is there any way we can check your oxygen? And she said, yes. The whole on. She went in and got her thing. And um, I'm reading texts that are coming in. Um, and then she uh, read it. And the first reading was 96. So that was awesome. Also, that day, somebody got born again um, in my back. Can you see my face again? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that's great. 
Uh, I feel like there was one more, but oh yeah, if you didn't, I can't remember when I shared these, but it's good nonetheless. I had we had a call back. Uh, hold on. Okay. <clears throat> Got a call back from this lady. Her name was, uh, don't remember now. And um, she was an old lady and she was on hospice for cancer, stage four cancer. And yeah, I told this last week, but it was phenomenal to watch her stand up unassisted and just to be able to go and do this at will. Um, we, um, we let... Uh, we uh, went and started uh, meetings at a potential house church in Neosho, and um, we'll make an announcement about what we're doing because we're coming up this Friday to Warsaw. <clears throat> but um, we went, and it was the funniest thing. We, James and I went, and our first meeting with this house church in Warsaw, in uh, Neosho, Everybody in there was over 70, if you can imagine. And uh, they did not act like it. They were the hootinest, liveliest bunch of women. And we taught them straight for three hours. No music, no prayer. They ate it up and just couldn't get enough at asking questions and all this. And we set them free of so many things. And then we prayed, we ministered healing to them. And uh, it was very, it was one of the best meetings I've been in in a long time. And we're going to be doing that this Friday in Warsaw at 5 p.m. Um, I don't know the address. So, Clara, you're going to have to help us out. <laughs> but... Um, Maybe you could put it in the chat there. But uh, we're going to be doing that at Warsaw this Friday at 5 p.m. And we're going to, and how we do this is the uh, the first uh, the, the first bit of time when we plan a house church is what we call a host home. And basically, we're going to go for around eight weeks and we're going to teach the first eight weeks of our training cycle. And that is just a kind of a short term commitment. And so, you know, that is just a manageable bit of time. Nobody's uh, committing to the end of the world or anything on it. And in eight weeks, you know, if it's going great and everybody wants to keep going, we'll go keep going. And that'll be an established house church with established meetings. And the, I would love to see that. Oh, there's the address. 32987 Highway MM Warsaw, Missouri, 65355. Um. I would love to see it grow up into that. There's no reason it shouldn't. It's just a matter of finding the right people that are out there that want to follow Jesus. Because there are people out there fed up and tired. And they kept telling us we have we have been wanting this message. And we've been, you know, we knew there's more and all this stuff that everybody says. But they really, they were convinced down there in the Osho, they were convinced and it was easy and it was powerful and we expect the same results in Warsaw. So <clears throat> get the word out. This is, this is not like our, um, on April 22nd, we're having a, uh, regional gathering up there. So this is much different than a regional gathering because we're, you know, when you, we talk about a regional gathering, we're talking about just gathering whoever will, it's going to be worship. It's going to be teaching. It's going to be ministering healing, but this, uh, these meetings are for the sake of uh, uh, training and equipping people to grow and to mature spiritually, to be healed and set free, and to grow unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, to teach them what it, what it really means to uh, grow up into Him in all things. So really excited about that. Anybody got, got any questions about that before we move on? Friday at 5 p.m. And we're going to go every other week. We're going to go every other Friday 
for a while and see how that goes. And we'll make more announcements about what we do in between. Hey, Debbie, um, you texted me that really cool testimony the other day. You want to share that with everybody? <laughs> okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes. New phone and technology is just not me. Um, <clears throat> so I had COVID, ended up in ER, and um, just had to get through this by myself and demanded it to leave my body. <clears throat> And the very next day, <clears throat> pardon me, the very next day I felt um, immediately better. So um, I don't know how I got it, but then my husband got it. I, I had it worse than he did. We've been vaccinated, but um, that's never a guarantee. So that's one little testimonial. Then the second one, because I am a hairdresser, you get lots of confessions from people when they sit in your chair from the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so I had the one um, client that was sitting in my chair Wednesday and she said, I don't have very good news. And I said, what is it? She says, well, I have um, been to the doctor and there is suspicious lump in my breast. And I, <clears throat> I asked her, I said, do you want to pray about it? She said, yes, I do. And so I put my hands on her behind the chair and we prayed about it. And we um, told her to leave her body in the name of Jesus. And, um, and I said, when is your appointment? Oh. She says, well, I go to the specialist Monday. So I said, I will be in touch with you this week then. She said, well, I'll probably be later on in the week. And I said, I understand because of um, tests and et cetera. Well, she couldn't wait because Monday evening when I sent a message to you, then she said they came back and said no tumors. And I, I will tell you, that when I was sitting behind or standing behind her and my hands were on her, that as soon as I said that we demand this to leave this body now and um, in the name of Jesus Christ, I felt tingling from my head clear down to my toes. <laughs> and... Um, it, it, you know, sometimes I get goosebumps when people sing or something like that. <clears throat> this was totally different. And, um, but when she told me that they said there is nothing, then I said, well, you know, we prayed about it and we demanded it to leave. And um, in the name of Jesus. And she said, yes, we did. So. I mean, I didn't think I had it in me. I thought I was still in training. I thought I was still in training because I, you know, you just, you just never know. So um, I feel good about it because, you know, uh, I think Deb one time said, you know, you got to make that, or you got to make that step once you do it, you know, and I did it. So I was so proud of myself. I had to share it with you because uh, I couldn't wait till tonight. <laughs> and I knew I was going to run late. So anyway, um, I'm, I'm all excited. So yep. Hallelujah. I do remember in one of the meetings or the Zoom things that we had, Deb had said, you got to just do, do that. Got to make that step, you know, and I thought, okay, I, I, how can I do this? You know, but Hey, she was, it just fell right into place. She was receptive to it. She is a, um, and for some reason she said something about Psalms 23, but that's not, but she kept talking about the, the table prepared. And, um, so I haven't had it. I know what Psalms 23 says, but somewhere in there, she mentioned something about, 
uh, table was prepared. And she said, well, who do you think prepared it though? We want you to come to sit at the table. So I, maybe there's longer version of that that I need to read, but um, it's, that evidently came to her mind for her to say it. So maybe you can enlighten on that. One, but well, anyway. first of all, great job. Great job. That was awesome. That is exactly what you're supposed to do. You did it and you do have it in you. <laughs> uh, you know what people... And didn't think I had it. Well, now, you know. now you know. <laughs> don't, uh, ever, yeah. don't ever doubt it from here on. Whenever people get in crisis, they uh, cling to what they know or what they've heard. And a lot of times, you know, that's a familiar passage or a passage they have on their, in, on their wall in a frame or something. So, you know, when COVID went through, a bunch of people were clinging to Psalm 91 and, um, and that's fine. That's good. You know, maybe that's the only scripture they know, but I imagine that's what, um, that's what she was going through in that moment because all of a sudden she, she met, she met the enemy and didn't know how to overcome it. But God knew that you were ready and uh, that you had a chair prepared for her. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. See, it really works, guys. Hallelujah. Um, <clears throat> so really looking forward to this Friday. Um, going to come packed full and ready. Um, so the, the size of the crowd, it means nothing to me. You know, I, you heard me tell that story of the Neosho house church. Uh, I think there was one, two, three, four, I think there were six of us total in there, but you couldn't tell because of the awesome power of God and the, the, the wisdom that was pouring out from the spirit. I mean, I, it was amazing. I just say it's just amazing. Um, it was amazing also because they never heard of some of the foundational elements of the new covenant. And that's things that uh, we see taught over and over, said different ways, but taught over and over in the New Testament uh, of what God has done through Jesus Christ and who he has made us. Um, the enemy has infiltrated the pulpits of the church worldwide and and has managed to conceal what God has revealed and the truth is always concealed through uh, concealed through unbelief and tradition and uh, the enemy knows what he's doing in fact Jesus pulled back the covers on one of his greatest schemes in Mark 7:13 when he told the religious leaders of that time you have had handed to you traditions you've had they've been handed down to you and they make the word of God powerless or or no effect, or they remove the authority of the word of God, depending on what translation you uh, read. But the underlying Greek means uh, when you fought, when you uh, accept a tradition over the truth, then you um, you replace the truth with something that's powerless. Therefore, you are removing the authority of the word of God. And. I was talking with Haley the other day and the important thing about everything that we do uh, and every, all of our endeavors is not that we build personal ministries and not even that we build big churches. Um, and, and our legacy is not handing down ministries and our legacy is not handing down churches. Our, our purpose is to, and Paul was always asking for prayer regarding this. Our purpose is to is that the word of God would, as uh, Paul puts it, run forth speedily and be glorified. So the thing that they took hold of down there in Yosho was not my personality, not my uh, slick ministry, not my methods or my programs I'd managed to put together, not my training materials, 
Uh, I went down there with a guitar and a Bible, and I didn't actually open either one. I just, the Spirit of God just poured out of my mouth and James 2 for three hours. What was elevated was the truth. And when we reveal and establish real truth, that is what brings change. Because this revelation of the new covenant, it brings complete transformation. And it is, and the understanding and the carrying out of that word and the teaching of it and the uh, obedience to it is what's going to change everything. Not, you know, we've got, I don't know how many churches you have in your city. We've got around 400, maybe some here in Joplin, a, a city of 60,000 people. Um, if, if the way we are doing church was going to fix the earth, so to speak, was going to get the job done, it would have worked already. Uh, but the truth is a lot of times, and in most cases, I would say what we are doing as a church, the purpose is not, does not match the word of God. And so when Paul said that the word of God would, uh, run its course freely, be fr freely proclaimed and be glorified, meaning being honored, revered, protected, stewarded, um, when that happens, that's when the kingdom of God starts to get done and the will of God starts to run through the earth. And when Paul talked about the word of God, he was not talking, and I'll mention this Sunday, but it's important to understand, he was not talking about, um, you know, our Bible that we have today. He was not talking about Genesis through Revelation because when he wrote that, um, there was no New Testament. There was only the the law and the prophets and and the first five books and and they were all scrolls <laughs> there was no printing press but what paul taught and what the other apostles had taught that we read in the new testament they considered scripture they considered the word of god and uh i wasn't planning on going this deep uh today on this but it's just kind of a lead up to where i'm going so I don't have like all these scripture references for you, but um, they are certainly in there. But when Paul mean, mentions talking about the word of God, he is talking about this mystery of the ages that was once a secret, but has now been fully revealed to the sons of God. Uh, this mystery is, and it starts before the foundation of the world that Christ was crucified before the foundation of the world, that we were predestined to be adopted as sons at the same time, that we were predestined to do good works, the same works he did and greater, and all these things that were predetermined ahead of time um, about Jesus and this kingdom that he would bring in the earth as a man. Um, and the mystery of this that no one knew about and that when Paul writes to the Corinthians, he said, if the rulers of the world had known this mystery, they never would have crucified Jesus. Meaning this, that through the sacrifice, uh, death and burial of Jesus, uh, that this was to not only uh, atone for or, uh, you know, cancel sin, but it was for the fact that, uh, and the word picture is, when you plant a seed in the ground, Jesus planted himself in the ground that he would bear a harvest of many sons. And so this secret, this mystery is that everything that Jesus did was for the purpose of releasing the spirit into the nations. I don't mean the heathen nations. I mean the, the nations that are born into God as sons. In Galatians 3, 13 and 14, it says that Christ became a curse for us because er, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. So that, or for the purpose of, or in order that, we might receive the promise of the Spirit by faith. So everything that Jesus did, and you'll see this over and over throughout the New Testament, uh, everything that Jesus did was to bring us into sonship, which qualifies us 
uh, qualifies us to receive God in residence, the indwelling of God in his spirit in us. And that's exactly who Jesus was. He was a sinless man uh, filled with or uh, hosted in God's spirit. God's spirit took up residence in Jesus. And that's what it means to be a son of God. Your sin is canceled and you are filled through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. God takes up residence in you that you could conduct yourself just like Jesus, live, breathe, walk, talk, and do exactly like Jesus. It's so important. Jesus told the disciples, he said, the same works I do, you will do in greater, speaking of when he left the earth. And he said, you will do greater works because I go to the Father, meaning I'm going to the Father so that I can release my spirit. And this is the promise that God gave Abraham, uh, that through his seed, meaning Jesus, singular Jesus, through his seed, all nations would be blessed. And this blessing is that all nations would receive the promise of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So much so that it says that the Jews and the Gentiles would become one in the Spirit, that all nations would come into the kingdom of God by becoming sons who are then qualified for God to take up residence in them. And so everything that we read in the New Testament has to flow from that lens, has to come from this understanding. Everything that's taught, the stories, the testimonies, the teachings, everything that we read in there comes from this vein that God sent his one and only son, that sin uh, could be canceled, and that death and all of its effects would be removed from the sons of God, and that the sons of God will receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to be, and Jesus said this, and in, in, uh, before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, he said, you will be my witness. You will be a witness of me. He didn't say you will go witnessing, although we do that too. But he said, you will be my witness. You'll be a witness of me. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. What he's saying is that if, if uh, people see us, the point of the whole thing is that we he would see Jesus in fullness, that people would see his fullness of us. So you have to... You have to understand this point if you're going to understand the New Testament. And I'll share that story a little bit because those ladies, I mean, they have been in church forever. And they knew all the sacred cows and they believed all the sacred cows. And they'd never heard of the mystery of the ages, which Paul puts in Colossians, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And uh, so we got a lot of ground to cover with them, but also... We have all been around church because we're in America and America is just saturated with religion. And you have to understand that the entire point of everything that Jesus did was so that you could grow up into him in all things. Uh, religion doesn't like that word into, but you can grow up. As I told the ladies, you can grow up in Missouri, but you can't grow up into Missouri, which is a totally different thing. We are to literally grow up into him. Okay? We don't replace him. We grow up into him. You know, We can grow up into him, and as we are commanded, into him in all things. And as Ephesians 4 states, that the job of apostles, prophets, and pastors who teach and evangelists is to equip the saints until they mature unto a perfect man. That perfect man is Jesus. What is a perfect man? Uh, what, what's the definition of a perfect man, maybe even besides Jesus? Well, he says that in the next verse, unto the measure of his stature, of his fullness, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And all of Paul's teachings is explaining this plan and explaining how to come into it. Everything that Paul teaches where it's like he's harping on this, he's harping on that, he is bringing people into maturity. So these are Paul's lessons, his way, he calls them his ways which are in Christ. These are for us to read and obey so that we could grow up into him in all things. It's all in there. All we lack is uh, perseverance in the, in the right direction. 
All we lack in growing up into him is perseverance in the right direction uh, and uh, some of this. <laughs> Keep getting messages. Uh, uh, in light of this truth and in light of the spirit. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit about this a little bit tonight. Um, first of all, people in uh, modern religion, modern church are coming to get forgiven of sin. Uh, but the fact is, God wants to save you from your sin. Okay, that's the thing that's left out most common when you hear the gospel preached. God's going to forgive you of your sin, yes, but that's not that's not the whole picture at all. God wants to uh, lift you out of sin and put you above it so that you live on the earth completely free of sin and all of its effects, completely free of death and all of its effects. This is stated over and over. Um, one of the places uh, is Hebrews 2.14, where it says that through his death, he might obliterate uh, or destroy the one who holds the dominion of death. And that word destroy means to make of no effect. So as a son of God, what Jesus has already done for us is make sin and death of no effect on our account. Now, that means that we can no longer sin. Uh, John writes this uh, in 1 John, that he who sins is of the devil, but anyone who is born of God cannot sin. Okay, so there you go. You can take a look at anybody you know who claims that they're, uh, who's got the talk but doesn't have the walk. They're not free. They, they have not been born of God. But when you become a son and you get and God takes up residence you by his uh, in you by his spirit, that has a profound effect and it's called righteousness. So let's read a portion here from Second Thessalonians 2, uh, 3 through 15. Second Thessalonians 2, 3 through 15 it says, this is Paul writing, but we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord. Because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. And you go, you know, Easter Sunday's coming up and everybody's planning for one moment when they give the altar call for people to pray a prayer. But uh, Paul doesn't mention anything here about praying a prayer in order to be saved. He said uh, that we are saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. So Paul's version of being saved is much different than you're going to hear in the in the modern church. And when they talk about being saved, um, you know, when you hear about modern church talk about salvation, it's usually a prayer so that you can experience uh, a rebirth. And sometimes it's a uh, sometimes people are born again. Sometimes it's a false conversion what we call it uh they believe something's happened but they are nothing has happened because uh there was nothing in their heart for it to happen but paul here is talking about a different kind of salvation you know this is a salvation that brings you into the likeness and stature of jesus christ what did it say about jesus it said that he neither he he, he neither could sin nor was sin found in him he neither could sin, nor was sin found in him. And that's true about you as well. Remember, we are predestined to be conformed into his image, into his likeness. We have been given a divine nature and made partakers of it. So Jesus was a man. He stripped off everything that made him God, came as a normal man, but a sinless man. And God's spirit dwelled in him just like it does us through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus could neither sin nor was there sin found in him. And the intention is that you be so saved that sin finds no place in you, just like Jesus. That you have no sin uh, resident in you, that you do not act out of that nature, um, and that you don't uh, practice sin. Okay? The Bible's clear that if we sin, we have an advocate. Okay? That says if. If we sin, but when we talk about people who claim to know Jesus and who are in habitual sin, uh, 
and sinning in a cycle of sin and patterns of sin and sinning as a way of life, that person does not know God and, and even says, John says, nor has he seen him. So God chose you as the first fruits to be saved. And let's just break it down. By two things, are we going to see salvation take place in our life? Salvation is not praying a prayer. So if you die, you go to heaven. Salvation is uh, you maturing, spiritually maturing into the perfect man, into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That is God's picture of salvation. This word salvation in the Greek is sozo, a means to be made whole. Okay. And Jesus is the perfect picture of wholeness. So through sanctification by the spirit and belief in the truth to this, he has called you through our gospel. So you want to know what your calling is. This is also where he talks elsewhere about the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. If you want to know what your calling is, it is to be saved through sanctification by the spirit and belief in the truth. To this he has called you through our gospel so that, okay, well now we got a purpose here. And, and, and I'm sorry to disappoint you, but the so that here is not so that you could go to heaven. Although, if you happen to depart from your body, the promise is that he who is absent from the body is present with the Lord. But the whole point is to make you to transfigure your entire being until you radiate in his fullness here on the earth. That's the entire plan. Uh, for this purpose, that you may obtain the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. That you may obtain the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that interesting? Because that's one thing. If you said that out loud in a religious circle or, or, or a church circle, a modern church circle, they're going to rebuke you and tell you about how prideful you are and that we are worms in the dust and that we could never be that and that uh, you should repent of saying such a thing. But this is the entire point that we would be co-glorified with Christ. This is another thing that John wrote. Uh, he said, as he is, so are we in this world. And Jesus was uh, raised from the dead, ascended into heaven, and glorified and sat on the throne as a man in a glorified human body. And then he sent that spirit, his spirit, into the earth to indwell the sons, that we also may be glorified with him. As he is, so are we. Not so will we be, but so are, are we. Greater is he. Uh, greater is he that is in us. Okay? So this is the, this is the proclamation and the, uh, the revealing of the mystery of the ages that we are to be transformed into his measure of his stature, of his fullness, walking and talking, healing, teaching, raising the dead, that we would never fail uh, uh, in anything that we put our hand to. Okay. Now, it says that you may obtain the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. And there's the very beginning, uh, beginnings of scripture as they handed and passed around these letters from church to church, from house to house, holding firm to the things that they were teaching them. Paul calls them his ways, which are in Christ. All right. So uh, let's, look at the, let's look at this word salvation in the Greek, uh, to be saved through sanctification. This word salvation is Greek word 4991. It means to uh, deliver. It means to rescue. It means uh, health, salvation, and saving. Okay. So this is a complete deliverance. Listen, it's not a rescue if we come and fish you out of the water and uh, you die because you were bit by a crocodile. <laughs> right. Rescue means to completely deliver. And what are we being rescued from? We're being rescued from uh, sin and all of its effects, which is death. 
So, and the Bible even talks about that. He has rescued us from sin and made death of no effect. All right. This word glory, that you may uh, obtain the glory of God, it is, uh, it means dignity, honor, praise, and worship. And this is the Greek word doxa. And even if you dig down deeper in the roots of this word doxa for glory, it means uh, that the 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 very uh, the very most real nature of what it is will be shown. When God reveals His glory, He's showing who He actually is. He's not holding anything back. There's nothing being concealed. Uh, when He said when His His glory is shown, that is him being revealed in a truest sense and that we would be glorified uh we would obtain the glory of our lord jesus christ that we would obtain uh in us the very truest sense of who jesus is um there's this other part here where it talks about sanctification by the spirit and this is really two parts, and this is what we talk about most of the time when we teach. So we have, if we're going to obtain the glory of Jesus Christ, if we're going to walk in this measure of glory that he has put within us, that has called us into, uh, then we're going to have to obtain sanctification by the Spirit and a belief in the truth. And a lot of revivals focus on sanctification by the Spirit uh, but they leave out the belief of the truth. And if you don't have belief of the truth, you may get some breakthroughs, but you won't be able to pass on the, the way that you get to maturity. In fact, you won't even get to maturity if you don't have truth in front of you. You can operate in gifts of the Spirit, and you can be around the, the, you know, the outpouring of the Spirit, and you can walk in a, a measure of the Spirit of God, but Unless you have a clear path towards maturity based on the truth, you're not able to reproduce it. And the point is that we go into all nations and reproduce disciples like machines, just, just consuming nations with these sons who are indwelled by God, who, who arise into uh, grow into Christ in all things, into the measure, the stature of his, of his uh, uh, fullness, and shine out of that, and it's easy, easily reproducible because it's based on the truth. And this is where I kind of was going earlier, because in the modern church, we're it's not based on the truth. What we're reproducing is based on men's ideas. What we're re reproducing is based on men's preferences uh, concerning church and teaching and, and how we do everything. But when we get to the real truth, we get to the real plan. We understand, we ourselves have understanding of this mystery, which is no longer a mystery. It's made, it's been made completely open to us. It's been handed to us. Uh, we only need to give ourselves to it. And when we do that, we're going to find methods that are easily reproducible in people, bringing them to maturity. And, you know, all you guys have been benefiting from that as uh, clearly noted by the testimonies. OK. Um, let me say this. Sanctification is the immersion of your entire being into the spirit, which puts to death the impulses and desires of the flesh. So sanctification is the utmost influence of God's spirit in your entire being. A lot of people have not experienced this or the process is so slow that it's hard to measure results right that's most people's experience in christianity it's very 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 slow and then you get a little blip you know a little blip but so it's such a slow growth that people give up before they even gain a lot of ground but the point is that you be so uh that you be so immersed in the spirit of god that mix that when you begin to mix it with the truth, begin to renew your mind, 
that a, that this produces an irradiation of the glory of God outwardly. Okay? So the, the immersion of your entire being in the Spirit of God, listen to what, listen to what this Spirit does in you. I'll be, I mean, it's backed up in the whole New Testament. I'm going to read one scripture. The immersion of the Spirit of God in your spirit, soul, and body, it, it removes the effects of death, and it prevents you from operating in the nature of the flesh. It puts them to death. Okay, Paul talks about put to death whatever is earthly in you, and you just all you can think about is how much you're going to suffer uh, because you can't control yourself. You can't control your thoughts. You can't control what you eat. You can't control your actions. You can't control your mouth. That's the big one. You can't control, control your mind. But when you become completely immersed, this is what it means to be baptized, to be immersed in the Spirit of God, that life puts to death whatever is earthly in you. And I can speak from uh, experience. I went like 20, I don't know, 20 some years in normal church living. And I was the most zealous people I knew. When I, when I stopped everything to back up and go back to square one and get immersed in the spirit of God or to go to, to, to sow to the spirit until I was so deeply and profoundly impacted by the immersion of the Spirit, I never knew what it was truly like to be liberated from sin and death. I entered into a whole new plane where my mind was clear and calm and nothing came through there that wasn't supposed to be there. I had control over my mind. And the only people in there were me and Jesus, which was a new thing. <laughs> Maybe it would be a new thing for you too. But when the immersion of the spirit came, it, it came because I, uh, I began the work to subdue every part of me in order to yield to its influence in me. I, I, I made room for him. Okay, how did I do that? I began to bow everything that I knew that was possible to bow to Jesus that my will could participate in. And I didn't know any other way to do this. Nobody taught me this. I didn't, I didn't have like any, uh, I never read a book about this. It just came because I turned my face a certain direction not even knowing the outcome. Because listen, I've been in church for 20 years and going at this for 20 years, and I'd never, ever experienced this level of transformation and breakthrough, even though I have been a part of one of the top three revivals in the last 30 years. What we experienced in revival was nothing compared to my own personal immersion uh, uh, in the Holy Spirit. And the way and Haley and I both did this together, but separately, this is just what happens because of the fear of the Lord. We began to say, I bow every thought, every thought of my mind. And this became, this is such a holy private thing to me that I didn't even talk about it for a couple of years to anybody. I bow every thought of my mind. What's happening? Sanctification is happening in my mind. Nothing is parked or travels there that is not supposed to be there and that is not of him. I bow every thought of my, of my mind. I bow every intention of my heart, both known and unknown. Sanctification of the heart means that nothing that's competing with the Spirit of God is present. I bow every agenda and hidden agenda of my heart and my will. I bow it. I bow it. And I'm saying these things and I still say them. This is how I stay going forward and moving forward. This is how I stay immersed as much as I can and, and taking and growing into Him. As I bow every agenda and every secret hidden agenda 
Man, that hidden agendas are wicked. You'd be surprised what's hiding in your heart if you don't go in there and poke around and get the pitchfork out. But I begin to bow these things and I experience the sanctification of heart. And I would say to him, I bow to you every word of my mouth, that no word would proceed from my mouth that does not come of him. That's not coming from the old nature. Every word of my mouth passes through the filter of the sanctification of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Paul says this, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. And corrupt communication does is not, he's not just talking about foul language. He's talking about don't speak out of anything but the truth, right? There's all kinds of things that people say with their mouths that's not of the truth. Like uh, I caught one of my kids the other day saying the anticipation is killing me. Well, that's not a good thing to say if you want to live. Uh, I'm dying to go. There's another one. You know, you say that enough times you will go. Because our, our words are life and death. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. And if we're going to heal the sick and raise the dead, we cannot use our tongue for death and life. You're going to have to sanctify your mouth. Let nothing proceed from it. Paul even teaches this, and this is these are his ways in Christ. He's teaching us these little things, how to grow up into him in all things. Uh, let nothing co- proceed from your mouth that is corrupt. Uh, set your thoughts on things above, not on things of the earth. And you thought these were all like just burdensome commandments. He's teaching you how to be glorified, how to be, share in the glory of Jesus Christ, how to walk in the irradiation of the immersion of his spirit until everything that you get near, uh, it, everything that you come near or touch is in is endued with his life. You just walk around and unlock chains of death by your presence. That's who he was. That's what he did. And I also would say to him, I bow to, to you every act of my body. Every act of my hands, my entire body be sanctified, that I conduct my body in a way that Jesus would conduct his body, and that there be no conduct in my body that was that would oppose sanctification. And in doing this, I begin to make room for him. And I would start, I would start having these prayer sessions with him that would last hours. And it was like I was in there for a few minutes and I would come out and, and I would feel like I had been filled with a cloud from my chest down to my knees. It's like the whole middle of my body was missing. And in, and in those times when I was immersing myself in the spirit, I was receiving sanctification that led to salvation what are you talking about? You mean like you weren't saved? No, I'm saying I experienced what it's like to live like Jesus. That's sanctification. That's saving. That's salvation by sanctification. You begin to experience what it's like to live as Jesus. Here's another one. Saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. So it's two things that are going to primarily cause us to grow up into Him in all things. Because we cannot just be a walking river and never come to a knowledge and obedience of the truth. You see these people and they operate in some gifts and some in some power and they, they heal some folks and get some stuff done. Or they appear to operate in things. But their life is a train wreck, and they don't they have no truth, no foundation in them. They won't last. But a belief in the truth is critical if you're going to grow up into him. And this is the part where we talk about the renewal of the mind, being renewed, having your mind so in such agreement with the truth that you and Jesus, Literally, walk together in your body. 
Paul talks about this sanctification that leads to salvation, that leads to maturity, that leads to holiness, that leads to experiential knowledge and what it means to walk like Jesus and in his abilities and in his commands. This is Romans 8, 13. I'm going to read 13 through 17, and then we'll call it quits here. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. That's what it means to be saved through sanctification and belief in the word or belief in the truth. Because if you are not lifted out of the old nature, if you are not lifted out in such a way that you do not continue to sin, and and if you're lifted out in such a way that everything about you, your entire being is purified and glorified in Christ so that your thoughts are his thoughts, your mouth is his mouth, and your conduct and the the things of your heart are of him, that is complete transformation. That's salvation. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. That's the fleshly nature. It's not talking about, you know, I'm hungry for a hot dog or a corn dog. But if by the Spirit, listen to this, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body. What's he talking about? He's talking about what we just read earlier, sanctification by the spirit this is how we are saved this is how we mature or grow up unto him in all things if you if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body you will live so life and death is determined by your immersion in this spirit of god and the renewal of your mind to the truth For all who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. And this is a popular verse, and everybody thinks this is talking about that you hear the voice of God that tells you what to do and when to do it. And God gives you a special leading to go here and there, and you are only, uh, everything you do, God gives you a sign or gives you a voice or, or whatever. That's not what this means. Can God tell us to do things at certain times? Yes. Does he need to give you a special leading for you to obey the Bible? No. But what this means is, from the Greek, all and in context, all who are led or brought forth by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Okay, what's it talking about? It's talking about sanctification. All those who are brought forth from death into life are sons of God. All those Who's, who who uh, reach sanctification, spirit, soul, and body. By the spirit, they begin to br- be brought forth, and everything that is of them is of the spirit. And we read these stories of these apostles, like Peter, where he walked down the, the road, they, they just lined it with sick people and paralytics, and when he went by, they were healed. And that brought people from all around the region, and they were all healed. And Paul got shipwrecked on the island of Patmos, and they brought all the sick of the island to him, and they were all healed. What is happening here? Jesus said, rivers will pour out of your being. What is that? That's p- for people who, who, reach, who, who experience likeness to the Lord Jesus because of san- sanctification by the Spirit. Let me say it another way. They reach they reach the, the measure of the stature of his fullness. They start to grow into him in all things because the immersion of the Spirit in them or the influence of that divine life and righteousness puts to death everything that is earthly in them. When everything is put to death that is earthly in you, when the flesh and carnal nature are no longer operative in your in your being, then you are a free man. And that's the whole point of salvation, that you can be free of everything that has enslaved this earth under the devil and his works. Jesus has set you free, completely free, from everything that enslaves this earth. And the point is, that we would be that we would walk in such a manifestation of the irradiation of his spirit that we not only experience what it's like to live 
like Jesus, that we also uh, are able to do the same works that he did and greater. For all who are led, who are brought forth by the Spirit, are sons of God. You, this is a little bit of a process, but it shouldn't be 50 years. This is a process that we can all walk through quickly and mature rapidly. We can't do it alone. We have to have help and we have to have instruction. We have to have each other and encouragement to continue to do it and continue teaching and going over and over this, the little things, the secrets that make it work. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery. <laughs> To fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption uh, as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirits that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God. How are we heirs of God? Because we received an inheritance when Jesus died. We received that inheritance of God himself resident in us dwelling in us by the Spirit, that we could so be fully sanctified, uh, empowered to live far above the ways, the philosophies, the sin and the chains and the slavery of the spirit of this world. Fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. He says it again. Uh, we read it in Corinthians. Uh, or in Thessalonians, that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is not talking about when you die. This is talking about right now that you might that you might receive the glory or obtain the glory of our Lord. In Romans, it says that you may also be glorified with Him. The two steps here for salvation, as Paul puts it. Again, this is not praying a prayer so that you go to heaven. This is talking about you being saved from the, the nature and line and consequences of being born into the race of the first Adam. You have been, but you have been translated out of that kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. And therefore you have inherited Christ and all that he is and has. And that through the immersion of, of his spirit in you because you have been made sons, that this life, this power, this uh, glory would so pervade through you that it would completely set you free from everything that is earthly. That is how you heal the sick. That is how you raise the dead. That's how you drive out devils. That's why... When we get near people who have demons, the demons begin to react. What's happening? The irradiation of his spirit, we are being glorified. <laughs> we are being glorified that we may obtain it. Not that we would visit us or rest on us and come and go and leave. No, that we would be up, that we would obtain his glory. I, I should say it like this inside out, that we would obtain his glory and that we would be glorified with him and walk in it. Uh, it says this elsewhere, that we would shine as bright stars in this dark and perverse generation. That's not necessarily just a cute saying. This is for people who want to walk above what has enslaved everyone around them and be and in, in walk in such a level of the Spirit's influence that not even your mind is corrupted by the world. Not even your thoughts are corrupted by the world. Not even your philosophies or your ways are corrupted by this world. Not even your emotions, not even your soul life, not even your body is afflicted by the decay of this world. Uh, the next part of Romans 8 says, or the part right before this says that his spirit causes our mortal bodies to be strengthened or empowered. God's spirit in us, this is, this is really what it is. God's spirit in us empowers us until we reach his fullness. But you can't do it without renewing your mind and you cannot do it without uh, perseverance. You cannot do it without continuing. 
staying strong. Uh, in the last part of Ephesians, Paul says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And then it talks about all these things we call the armor of God. But these are secrets that Paul uses to stay strong in the Lord and the power of his might. That he would, by continual operation and diligence in these things, walk in a continual uh, glorification of his life everywhere he goes. And this is the dude that healed the sick, raised the dead, walked into cities that worshiped foreign gods and watched them fall. And the very last thing he says in Ephesians 6, after he previously says, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, he says, praying continually in the spirit with all perseverance and supplication. And this, this if you're going to continue to grow in this, and walk in this and become a glorious son of God, which in the next part of Romans 8 is talking about the all creation is waiting for these guys to light up, to come on the scene, because we have the ability to set uh, the even all creation free from these chains that have come, come on them because of death. If you're going to grow and operate in this and not be, be a yo-yo Christian, you're going to have to pray in the spirit with all perseverance and supplication. I still haven't found the person that prays in the Spirit at all times, like the Bible commands us. But let's get some of the time at least. This will have a profound effect on your life if you're someone who is up and down with things of the flesh, who is up and down with things of your mind, who is up and down uh, with you know patterns and attitudes and conduct. What's wrong with you? Nothing. You just haven't put to death all the earthly stuff. How do we put to death? Whine and cry and beg for mercy on the ground? No. You sow to the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. You sow to the Spirit. You uh, become strong in the Lord and the power of His might by praying in the Spirit at all times with all perseverance and supplication. You get sanctification going and your spirit, soul, and body by the Spirit of God. Um, John Wesley said, give me, give me some men who hate sin and love God, and I will change the world. But we don't hate sin enough to rise above it. And we don't love God enough to only obey and do what pleases Him. But sanctification will teach you to hate sin, sickness, disease, and death. See, sanctification is beginning to live out of what pleases God. You know, you live, sanctification is you begin to live out of his nature. His nature hates sin. It hates disease. It hates death. It hates sickness. It hates Weakness. That's why God gave you his spirit so that you could be so empowered and strengthened that you could walk completely out of it. How? Just like Jesus. Christ has been made unto us sanctification, wisdom. A couple other things. I can't remember the verse right now. But everything that you need to grow into Christ, he has been made unto you. Because his spirit has taken up residence in you. And now you have to begin to, uh, through the sowing of the spirit, sowing into the spirit. What does sowing of the spirit mean? Sow into the spirit. What's that mean? That means when you have a choice to, to do one thing or the other, you always choose to operate according to the principle of the word of God. You have a choice to uh, heal the sick or just turn around and walk away. When you heal the sick, you're operating by principle. Jesus said, heal the sick. You will lay hands on the sick. You do it. When you have a choice to be offended, what do you do? You put that thing to death by choosing to be empowered in the spirit and walk away from it. You, all these choices that we have in everyday life, we sow to the spirit when we choose to do what the spirit has been given us to do. And when you continually do that and persevere in it, then you become strong. 
You become strong in the Lord. Even your physical body will change. You'll be impervious to sickness and disease. Not only because you have renewed your mind to the truth, but the truth is active and outworking in you. It's it's not just memorizing a Bible verse. It's experience. It's experiential reality of that truth and its outworking of your life. So the goal is salvation through sanctification by the Spirit. What's salvation? Is growing up into Him in all things through sanctification by the Spirit, that the Spirit of God in us puts to death whatever is earthly in us. Okay, we are uh, through the through the Spirit's influence, and you have to. This is a partnership here. You have to work with the Spirit. You have to do the will of the Spirit. You have to operate in the Spirit. You have to pray in the Spirit. In order for that begin to begin to work in you, that you would be saved because you become sanctified, spirit, soul, and body. You become your spirit, soul, and body becomes completely liberated from everything of this earth. Everything of this earth. You just gotta think about that. That's so amazing. And belief in the truth. When you tear down all these sacred cows. And all these untruths and all these things that you grew up believing about the Word of God that are even in there. uh, These two things together will cause you to grow up into Him in all things. Will cause you to be able to get up every day and choose to walk in the experiential reality of Jesus Christ. Not only is it possible, oh yes... But it is commanded of us. It is the it is God's plan for you. It this is called the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, that we would walk in this to such a degree that all of His enemies are put under His feet, that all nations are converted and discipled. Think about it. <laughs> the effects of this are profound and eternal. Thoughts, comments, questions? I said the island of Patmos. You said Malta. Where in the world's Patmos? Oh, that's where John went. Mm-hmm. Yep, yeah, probably no sick people there. <laughs> the island of Malta. Going once, going twice. Yes, ma'am. Are you, um, when you're on on Sundays, are you live? Yes. Okay. How how do I do that? Do I go through Facebook? Uh, what which which service? Because there's two. One thirty. Well, I've seen where you've, um, like, 3 o'clock in the afternoon on Sunday. Um, is, is that the right time? That's what I've seen on Facebook. Okay. So, so one, I, I do one thirty. There's a, two live streams on Sundays, one thirty and 3. One thirty you can watch on the website or on the app. Oh. Uh, none of this is on Facebook. So you can do one thirty okay. on the website or the app. The three o'clock one is more private, so it's only on the app. Okay, gotcha. So if you got the app, you can watch all of it, and you get there's okay. notifications for all of it too. Okay, thanks. Mm-hmm. All right, guys. The Lord Jesus Christ sanctify you, spirit, soul, and body, completely setting you apart unto him in all things, that you would grow up into him in all things and walk in the experiential knowledge of God in Christ Jesus. 
walking as him, talking as him, doing the same things he did and greater, the same results, the same spirit of wisdom, and the same authority coming from you. But you would shine brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter in Jesus' name. It is attainable, and you can do it, and we can do it together in Jesus' name. All right, folks, I'll see some of you guys Friday at 5 p.m. Cassie, I'll reach out uh, about a time to stop by uh, with you and Kimberly probably beforehand. And then uh, so see everybody Friday and then. Um, then we got the weekend. So. All right, guys, have a great week. Go study the word. Get this stuff in you. Meditate on it. Think about it. Eat it. Make it yours. All right. See y'all later.